Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We will now discuss signaling mechanisms due to catalytic receptors on the membrane. In the last session, we considered G protein coupled receptors and their signaling pathways through G proteins, membrane enzymes, second messengers and protein kinases. G protein coupled receptors themselves are one type are four of four types of membrane receptors. This is an earlier slide that we have seen. We have receptors which are ion channels themselves, what are called ionotropic receptors, and receptors which are enzymes themselves or which end up activating an enzyme directly. These are called catalytic receptors. Here, the G protein coupled receptor also activates a membrane enzyme but through an intermediate G protein. Having considered the G protein coupled receptors in some detail so far, we will now move on to catalytic receptors. Before we look at details of the catalytic receptors, take a look at a list of important neurotransmitters and hormones. Here are the neurotransmitters, these are the catecholamines, and here we have acetylcholine and the neurotransmitters which are single amino acids glutamic acid, glycine and GABA, gamma amino butyric acid. Then we have the hormones here, all the hypothalamic hormones, the releasing hormones, corticotrophin releasing hormone, thyrotrophin releasing hormone, gonadotrophin releasing hormone, they are all hypothalamic hormones. Then we have pituitary hormones, growth hormone, ACTH, TSH, FSH, LH, prolactin, these are all pituitary hormones. The islet hormones being insulin, glucagon. Then we have parathormone and calcitonin, which are secreted from glands located within the thyroid gland. There's the adrenal cortex, the ovary, testis, and the thyroid gland per se. Hormones of the adrenal cortex, ovaries, and testis are steroids. The steroid hormones and the thyroid hormones act through cytoplasmic receptors and cause nuclear transcription and new protein synthesis. Now, these neurotransmitters, they have ionotropic receptors, Acetyl nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which are ion channels themselves, AMPA and NMDA glutamate receptors, glycine receptors and GABA receptors are ion channels themselves. The catecholamines, serotonin and dopamine act through G protein coupled receptors and all many examples of G protein coupled pathways involved adrenaline if you remember. When we come to the protein and peptide hormones, we will take four of them away from the list. Once we make these exclusions, the rest of them will all act through G protein coupled receptors. And what about these exceptions? Growth hormone and prolactin act through receptors which activate an enzyme directly. Insulin and atrial natriuretic peptide, which can be thought of as a hormone secreted from the endocardium of the atria and therefore atrial natriuretic peptide. It causes vasorelaxation and natriuresis, that is more excretion of sodium in the urine. That, those are the functions of atrial natriuretic peptide. Now these two act on receptors and the receptor itself is an enzyme. We have, of course, 
the rest of the protein and peptide hormones act through G protein coupled receptors. You have to add on vasopressin and oxytocin also to the pituitary hormones. So this is an overview of how neurotransmitters and hormones act through their respective receptors. We are now going to consider these two types of membrane receptors and their mechanism of signaling. Now, the ANP receptor we've already considered in the session on CGMP signaling pathways. We saw that the ANP receptor is a guanylyl cyclase in itself. A membrane guanylyl cyclase is what we called it then as against a soluble guanylyl cyclase in the cytoplasm. The ANP receptor is a membrane guanylyl cyclase and another term to refer to this guanylyl cyclase is PGC or particulate guanylyl cyclase. And that increases CGMP levels within the cell and we know an increase in CGMP levels can bring about vasorelaxation. So that's about the ANP receptor. We will now look at the insulin receptor, a receptor type through which insulin acts and the other type of catalytic receptor. Here the receptor itself is an enzyme and here the receptor activates an enzyme, a cytosolic enzyme. The enzyme in these two cases is a tyrosine kinase. It is an enzyme which will phosphorylate tyrosine residues in proteins. Here because this tyrosine kinase is the receptor itself, that receptor has the tyrosine kinase activity, we can call it receptor tyrosine kinase or RTKs. And this one is called a non receptor tyrosine kinase, this enzyme out here which is activated by the receptor. And this non-receptor tyrosine kinase is better known by the term Janus kinase. You would have heard about the JAK STAT pathway, we are coming to that. So this can be referred to as the Janus kinase. Now if you look at the ligands which bind to receptor tyrosine kinase other than the hormone insulin these paracrine factors or autocrine factors the epidermal growth factor platelet derived growth factor fibroblast growth factor nerve growth factor vascular endothelial growth factor all these growth factors including insulin like growth factor their receptors are receptor tyrosine kinases themselves. Now let us take a look at similar paracrine factors which work through Janus kinase associated receptors. Now that's a list of substances which would bind to such a receptor which will activate a Janus kinase within the cell. To remember this, I found this in Cora. Somebody had given a nice mnemonic piglet, standing for prolactin, interferons, interleukins, growth hormone, granuloc granulocyte macrophage, colony stimulating factor, leptin, erythropoietin, thrombopoietin. Leptin is a hormone secreted by the adipose tissue. Erythropoietin, you know, is a hormone secreted by the kidney and which can increase formation of red blood cells. Thrombopoietin increases the formation of thrombocytes. In fact, there are a few other YouTube videos which discuss the Janus kinase pathway and they've also nicely stated uh, a way to remember the ligands for this pathway as tins and ters. Uh, I don't know who it was who originally suggested this way of remembering those ligands, but there are a few YouTube videos I found which use this, this strategy to remember ligands for Janus kinase receptors. Tins and ters. 
that is the answer from Cora, which gives that mnemonic piglet. We will come back to this issue of ligands binding to these and what their actual actions may be a little later. Now, let us look at details of the pathways themselves. Let us talk about receptor tyrosine kinases first. Let us take insulin binding to its receptor. In fact, other ligands binding to this receptor will cause dimerization of the receptor and that is what activates the tyrosine kinase enzyme activity within the receptor. The insulin receptor, they say, is already a dimer. It exists as a dimer. However, binding of insulin to that dimerized receptor activates the tyrosine kinase activity within the receptor. So, this enzyme now is going to phosphorylate tyrosine residues. Where? It in fact is going to autophosphorylate itself, autophosphorylate its own tyrosine residues. So, these are now phosphotyrosines. The phosphates have gone and attached to tyrosine residues in the insulin receptor. Now, the next step is an adapter protein, an adapter molecule which will come and fix on to the phosphotyrosine residues. This one is called GRB2. The names are not important. It is called GRB2 because it is a growth factor receptor bound protein. Think of it as an adapter protein. Once that happens, other proteins can come and bind to that adapter protein and get activated. And the one in this pathway is called SOS. Again, the names are funny. You do not have to remember the expansion of those names. SOS actually stands for son of seven less. We will see a little later if time allows what this seven less is. Do not worry about the expansion of these names. Just treat them as proper names for those proteins. So, this is an SOS. This protein is called SOS. We will stop there. So, these are the immediate steps after the ligand binding to the receptor tyrosine kinase. Let us look at the final steps and then connect the proximal steps with the distal steps. The final steps are this. Here is a kinase called MAP kinase, mitogen activated protein kinase. It takes its name because if you look at all these ligands which bind to the receptor tyrosine kinase, they are all growth factors. They cause growth. So, they promote cell proliferation, cell survival, they inhibit cell suicidal mechanisms, apoptotic mechanisms are inhibited because they are pro-mitotic. They enhance cell proliferation, survival, etc. Because they are pro-mitotic, they are referred to as mitogens. These ligands are referred to as mitogens and they finally activate a protein kinase and that is called a mitogen activated protein kinase. Now, this protein kinase can translocate into the nucleus and phosphorylate other proteins which will act as transcription regulators. They will bring about nuclear transcription to induce synthesis of proteins which are involved in mitosis, cell proliferation, survival, motility, etc. Now, let us see how the pathway is completed. Now, we will look at a set of G proteins. So, the receptor tyrosine kinase pathway also involves G proteins, but we do not normally refer to this as a G protein coupled receptor. The G proteins involved in this pathway are small G proteins, which we have discussed in an earlier lecture. When we consider G proteins, it was said that they are GTPases 
they can bind GTP or GDP. When they bind GTP, they have the ability to cleave GTP. And the activated form has GTP bound to it and the inactive form has GDP bound to it. These are all commonalities between both the G proteins. Both are membrane proteins. However, the G protein that we discussed in the last lecture and the one before that were heterotrimeric G proteins. They had three subunits and the way they acted, they activated a membrane enzyme, one of four membrane enzymes that we discussed. Whereas the G proteins that we are going to consider now in the receptor tyrosine kinase pathway are small G proteins, which are monomeric G proteins. There are about five types and the one that is involved in this pathway is RAS. RAS is the small G protein and in its inactive form, it has GDP attached to it, just like the alpha subunit of the heterotrimeric G proteins. When in, in the case of G protein coupled receptors, when the ligand bound to the receptor, the complex activated the alpha subunit directly. It would shed its GDP automatically, take on a GTP, move and activate an enzyme. That was the sequence we saw. But here, the ligand binding to the receptor has done three steps prior to getting on to the G protein. So there was dimerization, activation of the tyrosine kinase activity within the receptor, phosphorylation, autophosphorylation of tyrosine residues in the receptor, binding of an adapter protein, and then another protein in the pathway called SOS binds to the adapter protein and gets activated. That's where we stopped. Now, this one is going to cause RAS GDP to shed the GD GDP. It will extrude its GDP and take on a GTP molecule from the cytoplasm. It will become RAS GTP. Now, for each of the five types of small g proteins, this step requires, this is not automatic. In the case of alpha subunit of those heterotrimeric g proteins, shedding GDP and taking on a GTP happened as soon as the ligand receptor combination activated it. But here, this transformation requires what is called a guanine nucleotide exchange factor. And in fact, it is SOS here that is the guanine nucleotide exchange factor for this small g protein. Now what? So we have RAS GTP, which is an activated G protein. So that is going to activate a protein called RAF. RAF is a kinase as well. It is going to phosphorylate another protein. So that is the sequence of event. RAF phosphorylates a MAP kinase kinase, something that is going to phosphorylate the MAP kinase. And then the MAP kinase causes phosphorylation of CFOS and causes nuclear transcription. So this completes the pathway for receptor tyrosine kinase signaling. There are some instances where MAPKK will get a different name. It's called MEK. And there's slightly different terminology people might use for MAPK as well. But let us stick to MAPK or mitogen activated protein kinase. The mitogen stands for the promitotic ligands that activate this pathway. And this is MAP2K, which is MAP kinase kinase. And RAF is a kinase which phosphorylates MAP2K. So here we have receptor tyrosine kinases activating mitotic pathways. There must be checks and balances in this pathway. Otherwise, there would be unregulated mitosis, which would lead to cancers. 
there must be ways of inhibiting this pathway at every level and there must be negative feedback mechanisms so that this promitotic pathway regulates itself. One such mechanism is turning off of RAS GTP. Gaps, just like Jeff's promote conversion of RAS GDP to RAS GTP, gaps or GTPase activating proteins will activate the GTPase activity of RAS itself which will then cleave the GTP to form GDP and phosphate. So it returns to its inactive state. That's one of the ways in which this pathway can get turned off. There are multiple other checkpoints. You will learn more about them in pathology. So this sequence of kinases being activated in this pathway, a cascade of kinases, in short, we can refer to this pathway as the RTK RAS MAPK pathway. That would be easier to communicate. We will now look at the other type of catalytic receptor, the one that is associated with a Janus kinase, which is a protein kinase as well. Sometimes these receptors are referred to as tyrosine kinase associated receptors, TKARs. The kinase itself is a non receptor tyrosine kinase, and the receptor can be referred to as a tyrosine kinase associated receptor, TKAR, whereas this is a receptor ty tyrosine kinase, RTK. The initial step is similar binding of the ligand causes dimerization of that receptor. That's the first step. Now once the receptor dimerizes, that recruits the Janus kinase from the cytoplasm and binding of Janus kinase to the receptor triggers the kinase activity of the Janus kinase. That again is going to autophosphorylate itself and phosphorylate certain residues in the receptor. This is followed by phosphorylation of another protein called STAT. This again, once it takes on its phosphate groups, dimerizes. Now this protein is called STAT, standing for signal transducer and activator of transcription. The expansions, as I said, are not important. Remember this as STAT. STAT being a transcription activator itself homes to the nucleus and causes synthesis of proteins involved in cell proliferation and proteins involved in immune mechanisms in white blood cells. This is what is referred to as the JAK-STAT pathway. So the two pathways involving catalytic receptors are the RTK RAS MAPK pathway and the JAK STAT pathway. How have scientists been able to make such categorical statements that this SOS, which causes RAS GDP to form RAS GTP, which activates a RAF kinase, or there is dimerization of STAT when it is activated by the Janus kinase? How are scientists able to make such categorical statements? How do we know these pathways so clearly? One way of doing experiments to realize the importance of these proteins is by doing what are called gene knockout experiments, where a particular protein is not allowed to elaborate in a cell by taking off the gene coding for that protein. Those are called knockouts. And if you have to study the phenotype of the organism or the function of that organism subsequent to a gene knockout, if that gene wasn't important for life itself, only then there will be a living organism after that gene knockout. To, if one has to study the phenotype after gene knockout, then it's obvious that the life cycle of that organism 
has to be a few days. Only then you can do quick experiments and a very important model organism which yields itself to such studies is a microscopic roundworm called Cenorhabditus elegans. So this model organism was made famous by the work of Professor Sidney Brenner who went on to win a Nobel Prize in 2002. You can read about his work. Another model organism which yields itself to genetic manipulation studies is Drosophila melanogaster or the common fruit fly. All of us would have seen this. I have a short video of this which I just made uh, in one of our coffee rooms, fruit flies settling on a coffee cup. You will see that video just now. Returning to signaling pathways mediated by catalytic receptors, we have considered the JAK-STAT pathway and the RTK ras mapk pathways as independent pathways, categorical cascades activating kinases after kinases. As we go, we will realize that there is a lot of crosstalk between these pathways. Some receptor kinase, receptor tyrosin kinase signaling may activate a Janus kinase and the JAK-STAT pathway may end up activating MAP kinases. So there's a lot of interaction between these two pathways. Now let us look at the ligands which activate the JAK-STAT pathway. Take a look at interferons, interleukins. These are cytokines secreted by white blood cells and that's why leukins. Then we have granulocyte, monocyte, colony stimulating factor, erythropoietin, thrombopoietin. So now you would understand that a lot of hematological cells, blood cells, use the JAK-STAT pathway for their cell proliferation. And therefore, this pathway is implicated in a number of hematological malignancies. And one strategy to treat blood cancers would be to inhibit this pathway. And one of those strategies would be to inhibit the receptor per se. Since we are dealing with membrane receptors, we will look at what are the strategies to inhibit these receptors which are associated with the jak stat pathway. These receptors can be prevented from acting either by using monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal in the sense these antibodies are developed against a specific sequence in this receptor. The receptor itself is used as the antigen to generate antibodies. So those antibodies will specifically bind to this receptor and therefore prevent its natural ligand from binding to it. That's the idea. So uh, these drugs which are monoclonal antibodies to these receptors, they are called MABs, MAB standing for monoclonal antibodies. While monoclonal antibodies can be used to prevent this antigen from binding to its natural ligand or this receptor from binding to its natural ligand, another way of inhibiting them is by using small molecule inhibitors of that protein. The monoclonal antibodies are named as MABs and all these small molecule inhibitors of either receptor tyrosine kinases or tyrosine kinase associated receptors are called pinibs, nilotinib, jeftinib, erlotinib. So they have this kind of suffix inibs. Tyrosine kinase inhibitors acting on RTKs and TKARs are used in cancer therapeutics and those inhibitors can either be antibodies or small molecule inhibitors. Let us look at some of them. 
the inhibitors of the receptors involved in the JAK STAT pathway are used to treat blood cancers and even some autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis to inhibit the immune system because these this pathway is activated by interferons, interleukins, which would be involved in immune mechanisms. So one example of a monoclonal antibody against a receptor activating the JAK-STAT pathway is baciliximab and roxolitinib is a small molecule inhibitor of JAK-1. Now, this pathway, you take a look at the ligands of, these, of this pathway, epidermal growth factor receptor. So this pathway is involved in a number of solid tumors, breast cancer, lung cancer, GI cancers. In all these cancers, the epidermal growth factor receptor is implicated. Either there's overexpression of those receptors or those receptors are active even without the ligand binding to it or they become constitutively active or some checks and balances are lost along the pathway leading to excessive cell proliferation. So there are monoclonal antibodies developed against some of those receptors and the best known is trastuzumab which works against the human epidermal growth factor receptor and is used to treat breast cancers. Erlotinib is a small molecule inhibitor used in the treatment of lung cancers. So that's a list. The ones in the boxes are small molecule inhibitors licensed for use in India by CDS Co, which is the licensing authority in India. Gleevec is the best known. Then we already saw erlotinib acting against lung cancers and lapatinib again uh, is used for breast cancers, sanitinib for GI cancers. <clears throat> now these act against an RTK which is in fact a mutated gene product, what's called the BCR ABL gene product and is, so this Mutated gene product is the cause of one hematological malignancy, that's chronic myeloid leukemia. And you would read about the Philadelphia chromosome and its association with this pathway as you go. These are EGFR inhibitors. And these are inhibitors of the vascular endothelial growth factor receptors. And that's against the platelet-derived growth factor receptor. Now this is again a list of monoclonal antibodies that we saw earlier, which works, work against the receptor types and kinases. The idea of showing the slide is that uh, trastuzumab, which is licensed for use in breast cancers, however is not yet licensed for use in head and neck cancers. That's the paper evaluating these monoclonal antibodies for use in head and neck cancers. So any drug which is licensed for treating one cancer does not automatically get a license for use in another situation. So for every situation, the drug or the monoclonal antibody has to be tested. And what does testing of a drug involve? Initially, for several years, preclinical studies are done by screening compounds to see if they have a desired activity. For example, if they inhibit proliferation of certain cancer types. This can be done in cell culture systems. That's, that's why generally screening of molecules is done. And once there are hits, or uh, once some molecules show promising activity against a cancer. And then one has to move on to what are called phase one studies, which is safety testing of the drug. After preclinical studies on animals, where the drug is shown to be safe in animals over a period of time, safety testing is done on a few people after consent, 
after informed consent. The volunteers agreed to participate in the trial and a safety testing is done. Then the drug company or the university where the drug is being developed will move into a phase two trial which is done on more number of people, several hundreds of people. Here not only is the safety tested further but also the efficacy of the drug. Is it useful at all in treating the condition? So these will be patients who have a disease against which the drug should work. From there, if it proves to be safe and efficacious, at least as efficacious as existing therapy, then one moves into what's called phase three, where efficacy testing is done on several thousands of people. And then the drug gets approval for use for that particular disease. And phase four is a post-marketing study where there's a continued surveillance of whether the drug is safe and effective. So that's the kind of drug development programs which bring all the drugs that we've seen so far into the market. With that, we will close the discussion on catalytic receptors and in the next session, we will move over to <coughs> ionotropic receptors. Thank you for watching this NPTEL lecture.